Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Starobin, and welcome to America and Beyond on the New Books Network. My guest today is Graham Marcus, um, who is a author, music journalist, and cultural critic. He was born in San Francisco. He earned an undergraduate degree in American Studies from the University of California at Berkeley. He's been a rock critic and columnist for Rolling Stone, among other publications, and he's the author of a number of books, including Mystery Train, Lipstick Traces, and Invisible Republic. And his latest book, uh, on which we are going to focus today, is called Folk Music, a Bob Dylan biography in seven songs. Uh, welcome uh, to America and Beyond, Gil Marcus. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good to be with you. Thank you. Um, so I'll just briefly uh, give the sort of the format for this book or the structure is the seven songs, which in the order in which they are uh, <clears throat> written about go from Blowing in the Wind, 1962, The Lonesome Death of Haiti Carroll, 1964, Ain't Talking, 2006, The Times They Are Changing in 1964, Desolation Row in 1965, Jim Jones in 1992, and finally, Murder Most Foul in 2020. And I wanted to begin, actually, with Murder uh, Most Foul, which uh, you begin your chapter saying, since the day it was released, 2020, every few weeks I find myself playing Murder Most Foul. I can never play it less than three times in a row. So what, what explains your transfiction with that song? Well, I think the song creates both an atmosphere. It it um, presents a territory and it and it takes you through that territory. It's um, it's a long journey that never really reaches an end. Um, it is a swirling kind of experience. And every time you listen to it, you can catch just different emphasis uh, on certain words, uh, on certain songs. You know, it's a it's a song that begins inside John F. Kennedy's head after the first bullet has struck him in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. And he's you know, he's saying, what's going on? What's happening? And and then he says to his assassins, do, do you know who I am? You know, the the right. response of the entitled person. Um, and and now the, the entire song, to me anyway, continues to take place in Kennedy's head in the split second before, in the split seconds before the first bullet and the second bullet hits him and he dies. Um, but, you know, for 17 minutes, we're suspended in this bizarre and uncanny alternate universe where, you know, at first Kennedy is is uh, thinking about what's happening and what's going on and there are all different kinds of metaphors swirling around because you know he's he's um he's got a you know he's he's been hit and he's not thinking clearly he's maybe you could say he's not thinking at all they're just all these random impressions and words floating through his mind and then he begins to call out to wolfman jack asking for songs you know in in his last moments, I want to hear this. I want to hear that. Right. Play this. Play that. Now, other people might hear it differently. As you know, there are two songs. One is about Kennedy. One is about um, the great DJ in the sky. Uh, but I hear it all as uh, a seamless mm -hmm. story, and the the pianos playing this very simple melody throughout that never gets boring, that never gets tiresome um, because there's always something happening and the pianos are just there to keep a, uh, keep the pace going. Yeah. So yeah. 
it's not as if this song is a mystery to be solved. No. It is a river to float on. And, you know, you come to the end of 17 minutes you'd say i'm not there yet yeah I, so you I, keep floating yeah i found it transfixing also and i was struck um in your treatment of it there's this interesting kind of contrast that you make with has to do with bob dylan himself uh saying and this is with respect to lee harvey oswald uh dylan saying quote i saw some of myself in him he said this, Bob Dylan said this at a dinner held by the Emergency Civil Liberties C Committee at the Americana Hotel in New York. Uh, continuing, I saw things that he felt in me. He was booed and hiss, not, I guess, the first time that happened for Bob Dylan. And then you write, it was that gift or compulsion of empathy for those before him uh, taken many steps uh, too far. Well, you know, the book begins with a line that Dylan said at a press conference in Rome. I think it was in 2001. Um, and he's being asked various questions by various journalists. And at one point he says, I can see myself in others. And that to me, you know, that, that really struck me hard. And it, it seemed to me that was if not the key, a key to his work from the beginning uh, to now, that um, this is a person who can see himself in others and see how others feel. He can walk in other people's footsteps. And to me, that was saying that the motor of his music is empathy, is trying to understand how other people might feel and think in any given situation. And I uh, imagine, yeah, I imagine that could be a, a experienced uh, by Dylan or by anyone as either a gift or a, a burden or both. Well, you know, I don't think of it as a as a gift or a burden. I think of it as a, a kind of willful choice. I see. This is, this is how I want to move through the world. And this is what my art is going to be about, or at least where it comes from. And I, I found that happening all, once I come across him saying that, I found that happening all through his career. Um, you know, there's some very obvious instances of that in Positively Fourth Street. Um, but I think it's always there. Um, in um, in Hattie Carroll, in the lonesome death of Hattie Carroll. Another one of the seven here, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're standing in the shoes of um, a middle-aged black hotel worker and you're standing in the shoes of the man who struck her uh, and caused her to have a heart attack from which she died. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you are taking all these roles and you're standing in the shoes of someone who uh, is, is somewhat back from this and saying, reading about it in the newspaper maybe and saying, oh, this is so terrible, this is so awful. And Dylan is saying, no, you know, you haven't heard the whole truth yet. You haven't heard what's really so awful about this yet. And that begins to bring the listener into it. And so the listener becomes a character in the song, too, because you're waiting to find out what happens. And when you do find out what the true horror is, according to the song, then you have to decide, is that right? Is that really what's at issue here so that gift of empathy or burden of empathy or simply the motor of empathy is not just i can see myself in others but it's a way of reaching beyond the song to whoever might hear it and implicating them too right so empathy is not just um, an open nice positive emotion Right. It is it is a kind of what's the right word? 
I was going to say a trap. Mm. Uh, it is a way of bringing the listener in and not letting the listener out of the dilemma of of the song. The listener is implicated in in some fashion. That's right. That's right. And I think, you know, um, the songs I chose, obviously Bob Dylan has written and performed hundreds and hundreds of songs. I chose them because really for two reasons. One, I wanted to avoid songs that I'd already written a lot about. I wrote a whole book on Like a Rolling Stone, so I'm not going to include that. Mm -hmm. And there are other songs like Masters of War that I've spent a long time on following the way it's um, been performed over many, many years and on and on. So I pick songs that I hadn't written about before um, in any meaningful way. And I pick songs that I just wanted to write about. Right. With, with Ain't Talking from 2006 from the album Modern Times. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first heard that. It's a very long song. It's the third album, uh, starting with Time Out of Mind and then going to um, Love and Theft and then to Modern Times. The third album that ends with a very, very long, ruminative, slow, um, contemplative song, uh, whether it's whether it's Highlands, uh, whether it's um, uh, the last song in Love and Theft, the Sugar Baby song, whether it's Ain't Talking. When I heard Ain't Talking the first time at the end of Modern Times, I thought, I'm going to spend my life listening to this song, and I'm never going to get to the bottom of it. Right. Um, which is certainly true for me. Um, and I I made stabs at it over the years. But with this book, I, I said, okay, I'm going to try and go as far into the song as I can. I'm not going to get all the way, but I'm going to go as far as I can. So I did that. And you write, uh, uh, there's an echo from Dylan's own As I Went Out One Morning from John Wesley Harding almost 40 years before. And this is your writing as paradoxical a song as he ever wrote. Yeah. Um, as I went out one morning to breathe the air around Tom Paine. Oh, really? What are you talking about? <laughs> around Tom Paine? Yeah. I mean, there's a statue of Tom Paine. Is that what you're talking about? Are you thinking about his his writings, things that he said? Um Common and, sense. <laughs> and, and and then the song ends with Tom Payne running up um, to accost the singer and, and give him a warning. Um, just then, Tom Payne himself, you know, that, that really? Right. And you b begin to picture that. You see Tom Payne running across a field. How wonderful. How wonderful to be able to travel through time that way or bring historical actors into your own time, into your own drama. So God knows what's going on with that song. Yeah, uh, I mean, in all of my decades of listening to Dylan, I have somehow, it's it, beginning as a teenager, it, it somehow has never really particularly bothered me that these references were not, you know, sp spelled out somehow. I mean, for me, that was sort of part of the, the charm i mean I, no, I i don't think it's bothersome it's wonderful yeah um, but it also you know makes you wonder makes you think makes you cast around uh for something to hold on to um but with ain't talking i just decided okay i'm gonna play with this uh as much as i can and you know ain't talking just walking mm -hmm. well, that kind of um that that duality appears in so many american songs uh going back to the beginning um you can yeah, well, you, yeah you say it's it's not only the roman poet ovid uh exiled by augustus to the black sea it's a, a cool cat from the motor city who once had songs on the radio ain't talking just walking eating hug I'd grease in a hog-eyed town, heart burning, still yearning. Someday you'll be glad to have me around. Yeah, I, I mean, I start with Jack Scott. Jack Scott's mm -hmm. uh, wonderful record, um, The Way I Walk. 
The way I walk is just the way I walk. The way I talk is just the way I talk. Yeah. And there you go, walk, talk. He walks it like he talks it. Um, on and on and on through every kind of song imaginable. And it seemed to me that Jack Scott really got it, pinned it down. That's a record that Bob Dylan would have heard um, in Hibbing. In, and um, it would have struck him because it's a perfect record. It's not a record you get out of your head. Um, it just has a touch to it. It is so light and is so menacing. It's so tough. Um, and yet there's nothing blatant about it. Uh, how does he walk? The way he walks is just the way you'd like to walk. That's what he's telling Yeah. You. And you also bring it around to D.H. Lawrence in his studies in classic American literature at the end of the chapter on Fenimore Cooper. I am I. Here I am. Where are you? Ah, there you are. Now damn the consequences. We have met. That's my idea of democracy, if you want to call it an idea. I, I find it fascinating that Dylan can he can kind of be put into that broader stream of uh, American literature or in the Lawrence's case, uh, a, a British man reflecting on American literature. Well, the thing is that Lawrence hit on real truths um, about America that he found in its classic literature, um, meaning mostly 19, 19th century literature, whether it's Moby Dick, whether it's Hawthorne, whether it's Cooper, whether it's Whitman. Um, he goes back, he starts with Ben Franklin, he starts yeah. with Crevacour, uh, he goes back to the 18th century, but mostly, you know, is the, the this concentration of um voices in the mid in the mid-19th century in um in New England. Uh, for the most part. Mm. And um, he was able to say, this is what America is about. This is how it works. Uh, this is what it wants. This is what it fears. So those are, you know, if, if, if Lawrence is right, if he convinces you, these are bedrock truths. And you don't have to have read Lawrence to stumble on those same truths because they're there. They're in the soil. They're in the history that's passed on to us. So um, it, sex, you could of say course. That Lawrence, so. Lawrence wrote a map, and um, a lot of us live in the country that that map describes, and one of those people is Bob Dylan. He yeah. works in a similar way. He doesn't have to have read the book and say, aha, this makes sense. It already made sense. I found there was a duality, at least to me as a reader of your book, which again, the subtitle is uh, a Bob Dylan biography in seven songs. So it's the biography of the songs, but also in a way, the biography of the the songwriter, the song creator, which had me wondering whether this in a way was America's story. And I also was, I came back to the beginning of, Augie March, you know, Saul Bellow, I am an American, Chicago born, and go at things as I have taught myself, freestyle, and will make the record in my own way. First to knock, first admitted, sometimes an innocent knock, sometimes a not so innocent. I, somehow that, for me, relates to this broader stream uh, that includes Bob Dylan. Sure, that's wonderful. That's brilliant. Um, you know, he could he could be reciting that on stage tonight and it would make perfect sense and everybody would understand it, I think. Um, you know, this book had its beginning when I was approached by the editor of the Yale University Press series, Jewish Lives. And the premise of this is you you take a writer and that writer is, is supposed to come up with a fresh look um, at a renowned Jewish figure. And they start off with, you know, very famous people like, say, Einstein. Um, and then as the series goes on, it picks up Hank Greenberg, the first major Jewish baseball player, mm -hmm. um, um, all different kinds of, you know, singers and entertainers and philosophers, 
all sorts of people. And the series has been very successful in terms of producing books that are really interesting um, from perspectives that you never would have expected. They're short books and they've been very successful commercially. People read them. Some people make sure they read every, every single one of them. And there are many, many. So I was approached and asked to do the book in that series on Bob Dylan. And I said, I can't understand why this would be needed, why this would be an interesting thing to do. Here's someone he's been written about from one end of the earth to the other. There have been many, many biographies. Yeah. Um, there are stations of the cross that any biographer would have to address, you know, his his arrival in New York City, his going electric, his conversion to Christianity, and on and on. Yeah. Who, wants to, who wants to do that again? I don't want to do that. Right. You know, so I said, no, this, you know, this well, isn't Jewish a book I'd want to write, and it's not a book I'd want to read. Yeah. Well, how did the Jewish life theme, though? I mean, I often think about that as well. At my uh, daughter's bat, bat, <laughs> bat mitzvah, I read a little bit of the, you know, Forever Young, uh, and and I've always been fascinated by Dylan's own spiritual life. And does he have this sense of Jewish identity? You mentioned the Christian conversion. I've never really known entirely what to think about that, although I've enjoyed that music as well. So is it? it's interesting that they would approach it from that perspective. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, if you're going to write a biography of Bob Dylan, there's certain things you have to do. Yeah. So I said, no, um, you know, I'm not the right person. And then I thought about it a little more. And I thought, well, what if it was a biography, a picture of a person uh, constructed around a, a small number of songs? I have no idea what they would be that this person wrote or performed. And that would tell you about the kind of person it would take to write or perform this song or perform this song in this way and the songs themselves would tell you something about that person too and i said what if it were done that way so um the editor liked that idea but the editorial board didn't and so i was talking to my own editor about yale asking you know, what I might do for a next book. And I told him this story and he said, well, I'll publish that book. We'll just publish it as a Yale book. Forget about the Jewish Lives series. Right. right. So I said, okay, because by then I really wanted to write the book. Um, I didn't know that I would start with Blown in the Wind and I'd write 60 or 70 pages on that book, taking up, I mean, on that song, mm -hmm. taking up a good a good part of the book. But the story of that song became so fascinating and so rich. The factual story, the rumors and tall tales surrounding it, the countless different versions, the way that Dylan has performed the song over the course of his entire career, uh, how it's changed. The words haven't changed, um, but the presentation has changed you know, so radically, it's a song that he's often performed on election night, um, saying, okay, a choice has to be made. You've made a choice. You're making a choice. Um, and this is the, this is what the choice right. you're about, making. At the beginning, about. yeah, the beginning of the chapter, though, you write, uh, quoting your friend, uh, Barry Frank Franklin, kind of ersatz when we first heard Bob Dylan singing, blowing, uh, in the wind. Uh, and I guess you'd maybe heard first the Peter, Paul and Mary, uh, uh, highly popular version. I guess, you know, but, um, the Peter, Paul and Mary version of that song never made any impact on me. It just sort of went past me. Mm -hmm. it was so bland. Um, when we heard Dylan's version on the radio, Barry and I, one day in 19, 63 um we were struck by it and what struck us was just how obvious the song seemed it seemed like a you know a, a piece of propaganda that the times themselves were uh, demanding 
somebody has to write this song. Okay, I'll write it. What the hell? It was almost like a commercial mm. for civil rights. And it always struck me as a song that, you know, had no personality behind it. Um, it was it was not really there. And and that's, you know, it was never a song I liked. It was never a song I wanted to hear until many, many years later when I was asked to write um, an afterword to an illustrated book of the song. You know, an artist had gotten the idea that he would he would paint the song line by line and make a children's book out of it. And it's a children's book for six, seven-year-olds. You know, it's not for 14-year-olds. Right. So I had to find a way to write about this song in a way that would be comprehensible and make sense and be interesting to six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. Well, that's a tricky thing to do. And so in the course of doing that, I began to hear the song in a different way. I began to hear the song as addressed to people who don't know the world yet, but the song is introducing them to the world. Um, and then the song opened up, and then I really heard it for the first time, decades after I had heard it for the first time. Um, and then I had something to write about. Well, and you write in the chapter on Blowing in the Wind that the blowing in the wind lived its own life as if it were a person. It made its own biography. As a folk song, it came from the deepest caverns of the 19th century after the Civil War, when to say, as tens and then hundreds and then thousands of singers did, a man ain't nothing but a man, was to say he was a man. Yeah, from John Henry. From That's John right. Henry. Yeah. Uh, so it made its own biography. So in a way, and you begin the book with this song, in a way, I suppose that chapter kind of encapsulates what you're trying to do with the book. And, you know, the way this book was written or built, constructed, is that I read through every interview with Bob Dylan that I could find. Dozens and dozens. Ah, that must be a lot. Yeah. Over the whole course of his career. Most of them are interesting. A lot of them are completely fascinating and compelling. None of them are perfunctory or trivial. Um, and one of the you know, greatest statements he ever made about his own work was in a speech for the Music Cares Foundation, a foundation meant to support um, musicians in their when they're incapacitated, when they can't uh, help themselves. Mm -hmm. And so he's being given a um, the award for a given, that year in the 2000s, and he has to give a talk. And he gives a 45-minute carefully worked out talk. It's not extemporaneous in any way at all. It is a built, constructed talk where he describes how he came to write the songs he did, and he's quoting himself throughout, and he'll quote a verse, and how did I come to write that? And he also settles a lot of scores, mm -hmm. attacking, attacking people who have um, put him down over the years. You know, it's like he opened his box of grudges, and everything is there neatly filed, and he picks out the ones yeah. to deal with. You're not much box. of a singer. I mean, he's heard that many times. And um, and he says he talks about the song John Henry, mm -hmm. and, he's, and he talked and a man ain't nothing but a man, and he says if you sang that song as many times as I sang it, you'd write blowing in the wind too. <laughs> he's saying nothing, there's nothing fancy about this. Yeah, this you know this song comes out of that song. It's just a reimagining, a rehearing. When I listened to John Henry, listened to myself singing it one day, I heard another song inside of it, and I was able to write it. Yeah. Now, one of the songs, uh, Desolation <coughs> Row, that you write about from 1965, is a song that I have often found myself listening to, you know, by myself, just, you know, taking it all in. And your chapter is constructed uh, 
in a particular way on this song. I mean, you have a uh, kind of an an angle on on it, and you refer to the the lynching postcards, for example, which seem to be kind of a way in. Well, I really focus that entire short chapter on the first line of the song. They're selling postcards of the hanging. Mm -hmm. They are what? Yeah. What are we talking about? Where are we? And, you know, Dylan is born in Duluth. His father is born in Duluth. His grandfather emigrated to Duluth in 1920 was in, when his father was eight years old. Uh, there is a lynching in Duluth of three black circus uh, workers. And it is a lynching that uh, lynching postcards were enormously popular in the late 1890s and early part of the 20th century. And the postcard that was made of the photograph of the lynching in Duluth was one of the, mo the ugliest, most horrifying, most disgusting of all lynching pictures. And um, just for that reason, it became one of the most popular, one of the most collected um, all over the country. Um, you know, whether it was sent through the mail, whether it was sold in shops, uh, sold in uh, county fairs, uh, wherever you might have found it. Um, it was one of the real, uh, the real hits. Yeah. Lynching postcard top 40. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and this is, this is, you know, one of those things in American history that was once common knowledge. Certainly in the early part of the 20th century, everybody knew what lynching postcards were. Mm -hmm. it's, part of, it's part of American history, and this is something that I go into in some detail in the book, the whole question of erasure, the whole question of, of, of um, taking something that was once part of common memory and removing it from common memory so nobody no longer knows yeah. I didn't about. I didn't know what it I mean I grew up in New England and uh, I was born in 1957 and then you know you write in the book that uh, there had been a craze for postcards of lynchings of, of black Americans by crowds of white Americans uh, postcards sent through the U.S. mail traded among collectors sold in souvenir shops and at country fairs so there you have it. I mean, you know, who knew? I mean, it wasn't something that was taught to me and, in, in, you know, my public uh, school uh, career in Worcester, Massachusetts. Well, and it wasn't it wasn't taught in the public schools of, of Duluth um, or Hibbing either. And yet there were certain ways in which the memory lingered. Certainly Bob Dylan knew about it one way or the other right so when he opens a song with their selling postcards of the hanging uh, that can be received by the people who are hearing it in 1965 as some kind of strange metaphor but for him as a songwriter it is a metaphor but it's also a reference to something extremely specific and it takes many years for his listeners to realize what that specificity might be. It's talking about this 1920 lynching. Um, and so I simply wrote about the way events enter songs and are changed in songs and how memory, how historical memory works and how this song is part of the process of American memory. Um, and that was just something that was wonderful to play around with. Yeah. And, you know, and I and there are parts of my own family history relating to a lynching that took place in San Jose in the 1930s um, that came into this, too, uh, in the sense of something that happened that was an enormous event with, with incredible publicity that absolutely everybody knew about it. it was a cataclysmic event and it was erased from history so by the time i was growing up in the 40s and 50s 
Uh, no one ever spoke of it. There, it was never mentioned in in any kind of media. It was as if it had never happened. It had been wiped off the map. Right. Well, this idea of specificity uh, leading to metaphor, as in this song, does that describe other uh, Dylan songs, whether ones covered in this book or not, that you can think of sort of little elements or something granular from his life from at whatever age that then became metaphor? Well, you know, people love to explicate Bob Dylan's songs as uh, simply regurgitated a biography. Uh, so they want to know uh, who's this song really about? Yes, yeah, sure. Who's this character in this song? Who is it? Right. Really, you know, um, and this has become a kind of anti-art disease that affects all forms of creative activity. You know, when you hear someone uh, interviewed about a novel they've just published, the first question is always going to be, is this novel autobiographical? You know, is this really about you? Did yeah. this really happen? Sure. David uh, Copperfield, Charles Dickens. <laughs> because people absolutely distrust imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't imagine that anybody could imagine something that wasn't here before, that doesn't have a specific referent. That is somebody thinking, what if? And then following where that leads. So, you know, blood on the tracks from so many people can only be heard as an account of the dissolution of a marriage and casting around for uh, love and affection in the wake of that disaster. And you want to know who this song is about and who that song is about and what specific incident this song is attempting to uh, both describe and, and, and hide. Um, I remember being on a radio show um, a whole radio show devoted to Blood on the Tracks. Maybe it was its 20th anniversary or something like that. And I was supposed to be on the show for the entire hour, two hours, where they would play songs and then various people would talk about them. And the person kept asking me, well, you know, given that this song is autobiographical, and I would say, well, I don't hear it that way. You know, it doesn't strike me that way at all. It's it's a song. It's a story. It's someone playing out a string. Where can this story go? And he said, well, but it's autobiographical. You have to admit that. And I say, no, I don't admit that at all. This went on and on and on. And finally, when the person brought it up for the 17th time or whatever it was, I simply hung up. Yeah. Um, and so I am not looking in these songs for... Um, autobiography. I start the book with something uh, Bob Dylan said, where he said, um, I write songs, I record them, I sing them on stage. That's what I do. Uh, the rest is not anybody's business. And I agree with that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, well, I just, I, I guess that I'm is my, to... that is my approach in this book. Sure. The rest isn't anybody's business. It's not mine it's not yours. You can make it yours if you want, but I'm not making it mine. Yeah. I'm listening to what the songs say in the world, the songs as they're completed by the listener. They're addressed to the listener. If they're about some specific incident in a given person's life, then the listener is cut out. Um, listener is told to be a voyeur of some famous person's foibles and difficulties uh, and triumphs and lies, whatever it might be, uh, these, you know, when you're engaged in, in, in a creative act of any kind, whatever it is, whether it's writing an essay, writing a song, singing a song, making a movie, uh, painting a painting, Whatever the proximate source of what leads you to begin that, maybe it's you know something in your own life, some trauma, some some incident, uh, some accident, God knows what, but something that has happened to you that you're concerned with. As that creative act goes on, 
if there is any creativity involved at all, it becomes about something else. So its source be, uh, doesn't, sure, matter. Sure. It doesn't matter I, at all. I was and, just, uh, yeah, playing off, you know, postcards the, from, from The Hanging, which which seems to have, as you said, that kind of specific grounding, you know. Well, it, it does, but you don't have to hear it that way. No, of course not. And, you know, in 1965, when nobody had any knowledge of what it specifically referred to, they didn't hear it that way. They heard it as a very strange image. Who would sell postcards of what hanging? What are yeah. you talking about? Um, and you just stop asking questions and you let it take you to the next line. And you move from Desolation Row to Jim Jones, 1992. Jim Jones is an old Australian folk song. It goes back either to the end of the 18th century or the early part of the 19th century. Um, and there are specific things in the song that refer to specific historical incidents that take place in the 1840s. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but the song has, you know, has, has an, an older genesis than that and nobody really knows how it's it's an old folk song that dylan sings um i i can't remember right now if it's good as i've been to you or world gone wrong one of his two 1992 1993 albums of old folk songs and blues that to me really let him to find his voice again after many many years of a pointless careerism um, and this is a song that in 1993, um, Bob Dylan performed, I think it was 31 times in the course of his touring of that year and never sang again. Um, yeah. and I was able to listen to all of those performances and, uh, begin to talk about what led Dylan to this song. What did he find in it? What was he able to put into it that had never been there before and also address the whole question of the milieu of folk music in um, the United States in the early 60s, the way songs were traded back and forth, the way they hit a chord for some people meant nothing to others, the way in which certain people and only a very few of the hundreds and hundreds of folk singers who were performing at that time and recording, only a very few were able to inhabit these songs as if they had lived them themselves and tell the stories they told as if they were filled with body and soul. Uh, Ann Briggs, Karen Dalton, mm -hmm. Joan Baez, and Bob Dylan. And I also was able to talk about certain entirely noble figures who didn't have the gift of empathy, who weren't able to become the people they sung about, like Mike Seeger, who was a mentor to Bob Dylan, a figure of inspiration, uh, a figure of aspiration, someone he wanted to be like, realized at a certain point he never could be said this remarkable thing that he wanted to sing old folk songs the way Mike Seeger did mm -hmm. as well as Mike Seeger did. And he realized he would never, ever be able to do that. And he was going to have to write his own folk songs. He says songs that Mike didn't know. I see. And that was, and that's his career. That's what he did. Um, but Many, many years later, he goes back to Jim Jones. He goes back to one of these songs that people were singing in coffee houses around the country that anybody could have heard. And this song is now speaking to him and he's talking back to it. So it's a great drama. That's a very long chapter. I don't know how many pages, 50 pages or something. Um, but it was a way of saying what did that place and what did that time give people and who was able to really take what it had to give and it's 
it was it was kind of humbling to see how few people I could find who um, who were able to inhabit these songs as opposed to sing at them. Yeah, and you write towards the end of the chapter on Jim Jones uh, of 1992, as he, Bob Dylan, sang Jim Jones across 1993, it was as if all the years of his great fame, from the time when he first abandoned the old songs and then played only his own, had been an apprenticeship, an apprenticeship. To get to the point where he could sing Jim Jones as if he had lived it himself. Um, and so, you know, a Bob Dylan biography in seven songs. Well, um, part of Bob Dylan's biography is Jim Jones, not just as a song, but as a life that he lived as he sang that song. Right. And his full consciousness of that. The song that we have not talked about that's in the book is The Times They Are Changing from 1964. I decided to write about that song <clears throat> after the riots, after the insurrection, after the disgrace of January 6th, uh, 1921, and um, the invasion <laughs> of the Capitol. 2021, yeah. Yeah, 2021, excuse right. me. Right, Donald uh, Trump's... Uh, and it, yeah. it just struck me... Um, you know, come senators, congressmen, don't block up the hall, you know, and and um, the battle outside is raging. And, uh, you know, it struck me that the rioters that day could have been singing that song mm. as they marched in, as they did destruction, as they defaced the Capitol, um, as they traduced... Um, everything that democracy in this country means um, as they committed crimes against the nation's best aspirations and hopes, they could have been singing that song, that song, you know, uh, and, and, and it, it struck me as saying just how weak that song actually is, if it can be used for any purpose at all, if it can justify any crime. Um, so I, I just wanted to play around with that idea of that song being the rallying cry of, um, of January 6th. And so it was an experiment. It was just a way of saying, what is there there? And then it moves on to, um, goes back to, just before the election in 2020 and the way that that the words from that song began to appear on the sides of buildings in a certain neighborhood in Minneapolis um all very artistic stenciled uh, by somebody um in different places around the neighborhood um the times they are changing and what does that mean in this moment, in this moment when we're facing um, an absolutely deadly choice about which way the country is going to go? Um, and, you know, the book is playful. It is just taking incidents in which the songs enter people's lives uh, and trying to put them on the page. Mm. Well, one wonders in when Dylan wrote the song uh, <clears throat> back then, you know, where his his sort of empathy lay. I don't know. You know, that song always struck me um, as Blown in the Wind first struck me as um, propaganda, as a as a song the Times wanted. Uh, and the Times went out and hired someone to write it, except it always sounded to me like it was written by a committee. Okay, we're going to write a song about the revolution that's coming. We're going to write a song about how everything has to change. And so make sure we get this in. Oh, you you left that out. Okay, we'll do another verse on that. And so it comes together and all the pieces are there. And it's this big rallying cry. It's this big anthem. Um and it's on an album that has real songs on it, like the Ballad of Hollis Brown and 
you know, songs that have real blood and sweat and tears in them. Times they are changing is just um, a slogan. And it's a slogan played out over the course of a song. Um, but it's also a song that entered history, that made history. And in my fantasy, could have could have been the um, the theme song for another incident in history that we're, we're never going to be able to erase. Mm. Yes, January 6th, which may not have been the end either. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, I think we're approaching the end here for us. I mean, I appreciate uh, you being here uh, today and and reflecting on your book, which I encourage uh, everyone to read. I found it as a longtime Bob Dylan lover to be uh, illuminating. And there's lots of, you can enter the book in some ways almost anywhere and you can find something that will take hold of you. So I well, think... I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad you read from it because I have trouble doing that, picking out things to read. Um, but this was a lot of fun. It was fun to talk about, and um, you know, I hope the book is fun for people too who find it. I'm sure it is. Thank you very much for being here today with uh, uh, with the podcast uh, well, on American Beyond. Thank, you. thank okay. you for having me. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.